So thank you for this for joining us. Sorry for this delay. Um, thank you for joining a series of conversations that we've had. This is uh, this is going to be an interesting one. This is about uh, Toni Morrison, um, a film uh, documentary about her. So thank you for joining us. I want to uh, if you want to chat, please go to the bottom the Q and A button. Um, you can type in uh, questions. If you have questions for the audience, please do that. Um, we'll try to get to them in, a, in as soon as we can in some kind of an order. If not, we'll try to reserve some of these questions um, for later on, um, they'll be online. I wanna first thank, uh, for this series, I wanna thank John S. and James L. Knight Foundation. I wanna thank O Cinema, uh, Magnolia Pictures, and Film North. Um, along with the Walker Art Center and the Minneapolis St. Paul Film Society. Thank you for joining us. If you have more information, you can go to mspfilm.org. That's mspfilm.org to find out more information about these. Also, we are going to record these and I'll put them up on our website at a future time. So again, I want to introduce their guests here tonight. Um, they're interesting to me and I hope, think they'll be interesting to you. Um, I wanted to create a, a, a panel, a conversation with about um, black women talking about a black female author that I think is incredible. So first I'm gonna introduce um, Dawn Renee Jones, who's a writer, director, um, playwright, director, screenwriter. She uh, teaches um, right now at Columbia College in Chicago. She's also uh, a, a uh, alumni of a, a, a uh, Goodman Theater in Chicago. Um, also, she's a graduate uh, of Goddard College. Um, I want to uh, introduce uh, Christina Hamm, who is also a playwright, screenwriter. Um, she's actually an outstanding playwright, been nationally known and recognized, not just here, but also in around the world. So congratulations on that. She is, she, it's a funny thing, you did not put down your TV writing right now. So I know you're doing that out in LA because that's what's behind you but that's okay, we're not hating. Um, and I want, finally, I want to introduce Nikoma, I'm sorry, Nikima uh, Levy-Pound, who is a civil rights attorney and activist, had been a professor at the University of St. Thomas Law School, and also very active in the community and has a company called Black Pearl uh, LLC. Um, Toni Morrison, the film that, that hopefully everybody watched is really about a, I, I think one of the greatest writers uh, I read her books in order when they came out, uh, first with The Bluest Eye, then with Sal uh, uh, Sula. They introduced me to a whole level of writing that I had never been aware of and a whole level of understanding. She dealt with the Black community, but also dealt with the Black community from a female standpoint, which I hadn't really read before. And I think it's important to, to understand that. She approached things in a different way. She raised voice and she brought people together in a whole new way. She, I feel she basically, and we're gonna talk a little bit about this, she basically tries to understand that the black culture has value. I think because before that it didn't, and I think her desire to write this way, she wanted to bring the black culture value to, not just to black people so that we could, so we could walk stand up straight, as she says, but also to show uh, to white people that we had a certain humanity. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that if we could, what you felt about that issue and that aspect of her writing, I mean, sort of that, 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 that approach was different than some of the other writers we had been seeing over the years. What are your thoughts about that? You know, I, I want to say, I, I want to push back a little bit that she, uh, on, her, on the, the second uh, bullet mm -hmm. that you just gave about her writing to show our humanity. Mm -hmm. I, I think at the core of Toni Morrison is she's not trying to show anybody anything. She's really talking to black people. And if somebody not black happens to pick it up and get it, cool. But she's, she's us talking to us. And I think that that's really part of the beauty, a huge piece of the beauty of her work is this coding, this language that she speaks that only we understand just kind of inherently. I was listening to, I looked at the documentary again earlier today, and uh, I was struck, for example, by the line which she says, she's reading, I think, from... Um, the bluest eye about, and we hurried to get home before our hair got there. So only we know what that means, that our hair got there before us. And she doesn't bother to explain it to anyone who doesn't know what it means. So uh, that's a piece of her work, a piece of her work that really moves me. It's like, she's talking to me. She's somebody I know, we're talking the same language. It doesn't matter that other people don't know what we're talking about. 
What do you feel about that, Christina? I think for me too, part of it was like for me reading a writer when I started to become familiar with her work. Um, for me, it was like finally, like someone had really seen our experiences in particular from a black female perspective. Um, she really encapsulated like our lives in a way that was raw and brutal a lot of times, but also had hope and love in it. And for me, that kind of writing was hard to come by, um, especially because of the things that I had read before being an English lit major in a mostly white institution. Like I really had to seek that kind of work out. And so when I started reading writers like her, that was an important part of not just learning about like different experiences of black women because we're all different. There's not one experience, but also the fact that um, she, you felt like you were seen and your experience was, was validated in some way, however painful that, would, that may be. What do you think, Makina? I would have to agree. Um, I, when I went to undergrad at USC, I majored in African-American studies. And thankfully, we were required to read books by Toni Morrison. And there was definitely a source of validation for me in reading a Black woman's writing who was unapologetically Black and unapologetically a Black woman. Mm -hmm. um, as uh, Don and Christina alluded to, a lot of Toni Morrison's focus was not on whether white audiences understood her perspective or what she had to say, but rather validating our experiences as black, wom as black women and as black people in a society that was majority white and at times very hostile to uh, African-American people and African-American culture. So I just find the fact that she was unapologetic to be so refreshing um, and a source of strength in my own life as a lawyer and activist. I, I, I agree. I mean, I, I, uh, one of the things that I'd seen this film last year, and I remember really feeling that, and something I took away from it was that, you know, I'd heard this before, but I, she made it really clear is that what I like about her, she doesn't um, do her things with that white male gaze, you know? I mean, she talks about it extensively in the film about, you know, and I, and, and I think most of us that are artists kind of grew up thinking about, okay, so what are they going to think about what we're writing? And she basically gets rid of that and makes us, res makes us feel responsible to ourselves, to our own culture, to our own people about what we do, you know, what we create as artists, you know, because this is a, th I think it's, this is a time that we actually, as black artists really need, uh, as black people really need black art, I should say is probably the best way. Mm -hmm. she, she writes with such, from such a loving perspective. You know, she, she loves her subjects. And, and one of the things when I, when I reference her in my teaching, I tend to reference first the bluest eye um, and how she uh, has no judgment about the dark side of our characters the behaviors, the things that her characters do, uh, that they're pushed to do. She has no harsh judgment. She sets up the circumstances so that you understand how that character got there. Um, there is, it's not about being moral or right or wrong, but you really, I have compassion for uh, Piccola's father. I understand in that moment how he got there. And her work is so, rich with that love, that non-judgmental love that just says, here's the situation, here's how they got there. Mm -mm -mm. It's a terrible thing. But she's not, she never condemns anyone. She holds them in, in a loving, uh, in a loving vessel. It's a, I think it's like, I mean, she talks about racism, but also 
you know, the effects of racism on the people and how that ultimately affects their psychology or the, you know, their psychosis. And, and so, I mean, there's lots of incest in her books and people who do things because of they, they just, either they've gotten to the end of the rope and they don't know what else to do. They're just trying to hang on. Um, right. I think it's kind of what in our culture that's out there in the world right now, I think part of this, you know, right now, it's like, what would you think, what would you think Toni Morrison would say about what's going on right now in America? I mean, this, this sort of this rebellion that, I don't know if you can call it rebellion, it's this uprising perhaps that's happening in the culture. What do you think about that? Well, when I think about um, Toni Morrison's story, uh, The Bluest Eye, it actually inspired me when I was in high school to write a poem that had to do with uh, being African-American um, as a, a Black girl and just the self-hate that is projected upon us, right, by all the images that we're shown about who we are, office, often deficit-based images, especially being a darker-skinned Black woman um, and not really seeing myself and other Black girls reflected in a positive light in society. And so thinking about this notion of Pacola um, wanting to have blue eyes, it, it's sad, you know, in many ways um, that she felt that that's how she would be accepted, you know, in our society because of images of white people, blonde hair, blue eyes, particularly white women being seen as the standard for beauty in American society and how um, those images are internalized for us. And so when I wrote my poem, I remember thinking about um, just some of the ways in which I felt that my beauty as a Black girl was being undermined. And so through this poem, it was talking about a little Black girl looking in the mirror and basically projecting words of self-hatred upon herself as if she's looking at someone else. And then at the end you know, of the poem, she basically takes something and she breaks the mirror, uh, which is you know, trying to dissolve the image that she's seeing in front of her as if it's not good enough. And so um, I'm inspired when I read things like that because it's a commentary on how our society views us as Black people, as Black women, as Black girls, how sometimes we can internalize that self-hatred and not fully accept and embrace ourselves. But uh, because of reading stories like that, it actually helped me to push back against those false images and false perceptions and then to try to find positive examples of black women and girls to draw strength from. Like if I look at someone like Harriet Tubman, for example, dark skinned woman, mm -hmm. um, who didn't have a formal education, yet very beautiful, very strong, very courageous, and being able to see myself reflected in her image. Mm -hmm. And so when I think of T Toni Morrison's writing, I, I just see it as a commentary on what uh, we're spoon fed but also as a way of being able to draw strength from what she says and to fight back against those false images. And, and, and what, what is the question that came in is what, what ways is beloved about the haunting birth of trauma? You, is it about what? It? The haunting birth of trauma, beloved. It's a, the, uh, you know, about the, the beloved book. So the, it, you see that is part of it. I mean, she talks about it a little bit of it. It came from, uh, the beloved, but the, the ghost, the process of spirituality? I think all of her books deal with the effects of uh, generational trauma. I don't think there's one book that does not include that as a catalyst for behavior, you know, a catalyst or, or a reflection of, of self worth. I mean, all of her books deal with, and all of her characters deal with the, how we internalize trauma and pass it on generation to generation. Beloved, I think, is, uh, is embraced, you know, that, that ghost of Beloved is embraced because by making uh, uh, this ghost a, per a person, it's, it's, it's an easy leap for people to connect the dots. But I think that that is occurring in all of her books, uh, characters responding to generational trauma, internalized trauma. Yeah, I would agree. And I think it goes back to your earlier question, Craig, about what would she think about today? Like thinking about Beloved 
specifically and how she said it um, against the the freeing of the family, but still like Beloved being um, her having to kill Beloved um, because she'd rather do that than have her go back into slavery. I think looking at things today, like what we're seeing right now is part of the after effects of our country not dealing with slavery. And so a lot of what we're grappling with now are, is the lack of reconciliation that we've had about our past. And I feel like that is a lot of the work that Tony has done as well beyond just the black characters that she's focusing on in, the, in her book. I feel like a lot of it has to do with how those characters are unresolved within their own stories, but also the work that we have to do as a country that has still left us unresolved and the pain that we are all um, has been inflicted upon all of us because of it. I think that she's very clear about that in her work and that's what makes it so incisive. Yeah, I think the recognition of the pain that black people feel on a daily basis, she really captures really well. I mean, you know, it's, 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 when you read her work, it's, it's very, she doesn't, you just feel it in the writing in the situations that people are in as they go through them. You know, I mean, I was, Son of Solomon, where they just, you know, when black people could fly, it's just, you just want to go. You just mm -hmm. want to go. And I think that's something that I really feel is really, really important. I think, um, we, one of the things that we were talking about, um, somebody asked a question about what they had not read Toni Morrison. They saw the movie, but they have not read Toni Morrison in any of her books. Is there a Toni Morrison book, which is a hard question, I know, to say what would be the Toni Morrison book that you, if you're going to start the journey, you start with? I started at the beginning, but I don't know if that's the right way. You know, it, it depends on, it, it, I think it depends on gender and age. Mm -hmm. um, my brother, who is uh, in his 60s, I recommended Home or Song of Solomon for a, a man in his, a black man in his 60s. That would be a way for him to get into Toni Morrison. I came into Toni, I read Sula first, and then I read Blue's Eye. And Sula, for, you know, I was uh, in my early 20s, mid 20s, Sula was the, was the right point of entry for me. So, you know, I think it does depend on gender and, and age. Yeah, I, um, I started with Beloved when I was at USC as well. Um, and Ooh. it was, uh, it was um, I know, I, I was like, it really blew my hair back. I was like, who is this woman? I got to read more of her stuff. Like, right. this is amazing. Um, but then it's interesting, like, just once again, thinking about the context of what's going on now and everything, like, I really love Paradise for a lot of reasons, for um, the fact that it's a story about a community that, a Black community, a community of women, like, I, there's something about that that I really love that I think is is a good place to start if I were starting over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nikki, which one do you think? I, I really love the bluest eyes, I said, but really all of her work <laughs> is phenomenal. I think part of it just depends on also maybe your level of humility and, and what you're really seeking, you know, at a, a certain point in your life because even as a black woman, as a black girl, I still have to approach her work with a certain level of humility in order to go inside of the story and not just read it, you know, like a transaction, but actually to try to read it and to feel what is being spoken, you know, and to get into the life of the characters. So uh, I would say, you know, if someone is on a racial justice journey, if they're on the journey of self-discovery, I don't know that they can go wrong with any of her books. I always you just say, have to prepare for a wild ride. <laughs> well, I always say when uh, most books I read, especially fiction, I can read it on the beach. I can read it on the bus. I can lay on the couch and read it. Toni Morrison, I have to sit at the kitchen table with a glass of water. 
<laughs> Two feet on the floor. Pay attention. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, she's hard. I mean, beloved's hard book for men to read. I mean, that's a, that's one I think is a hard one to. Yeah. to you know, it's a tough one. But you got to be open to it, like you said, Nikim. You got to be open. You can't like put just. You can't like come in with an attitude. Um. Somebody asked a question about uh, the documentary about um. The, you know this. The, the what the important aspects of, of her life or tra life trajectory as she goes from an artist to a book editor, you know, on the screen, they found that really familiar. Uh, it's interesting because that that is her life. I mean, she's a writer, but her life, I, thought, I think a lot of people, I, I what I like about her is she wasn't the kind of writer that had a lot of issues going on. She wasn't drinking. Mm -hmm. She wasn't, you know, she was kind of, you know, it, do you find that important that they showed that in the documentary? I do. I, I think what was important to me about it was, was, I mean, I knew about her life as a book editor, but for me as an artist, what I found so many of the things I found moving about it was that she actually got um, published and well-known later in life. And so often we hear about artists and we think they come out of the gate you know, blazing, like they start to have their career, like she had a whole full life before she even became published. And I think that that's important to see, um, rather than to see her at 20, you know, being brilliant all of a sudden. Um, so that's what I loved about and it. To be a single mom and, uh, you know, all the stereotypes that go along with the black single mom and, you know, and I, you know, she struggled, obviously <laughs> she says that, but she, she did what she needed to do and she rose above that. And, you know, I thought it was the same her, her transparency was also really refreshing when she was talking about wanting to get away from her family. So going off to Howard rather than the school that was close by, which was Oberlin. And then they show her um, in a picture with football players. And at that moment, <laughs> she says, I was loose when I was at Howard. I just, <laughs> just howled with laughter when she said that, because normally it's so taboo, you know, for Black women to talk about uh, sex in that way. But she just, she was mm -hmm. like, look, I don't regret it. I did what I did, you know. <laughs> so I, I, I thought that would be liberating uh, for young Black women to see uh, and to see her take ownership, like this is a part of who I am. Uh, and then also just to see her as a working mom, doing what she had to do. I can only imagine the amount of pressure that was on her shoulders, uh, playing those dual roles as a writer, as an editor, as a black woman, you know, in a, a, a male dominated environment that was also an old boys network um, and trying to navigate that and, and stay centered and grounded uh, and who she was. And I can only imagine some of her colleagues trying to pressure her to make changes, you know, to her writing, to who she was in order to fit in. But to me, her power really was in the fact that she stayed true to herself. And like I was saying before, just being unapologetic as a Black woman and letting her voice come through and letting our stories come through in a way that was uh, extremely uh, authentic as well as unique. I think that she makes a point to, that, you know, that from several critics, I guess, or reviewers of her books that, you know, when is she going to start writing, you know, white characters or she'd be a better writer if she wrote the white people, which is, you know, for, for black people, that is probably the most insulting thing you can possibly say on this yeah. planet they call earth and it's you know and she takes it and she but she comes back at it i think very 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 unemotionally but very 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 sternly and dresses that which i think is great i love that part of the story too can i add a point mm -hmm. to, sure. mm -hmm. to that participant's question mm -hmm. um, i think what was also important and that she was told by her kanaf editor and what really struck me, and I think being a fellow artist, is when he mentioned that he told her that she needed to stop being an editor and accept that she's a writer and to go and do that full time. Like she had talked about accepting that she was a writer, but that, you know, she was still doing both jobs. And to fully commit to that, I thought was really 
really important that sometimes you need a nudge <laughs> to be told to like go and do the thing that you're gifted at. Yeah, to be a, yeah, yeah, exactly. And almost an approval. So you needed somebody else to say that to, to, to make that happen. You know, I thought that the documentary really was a beautiful documentary, um, especially the second time I watched it. You know, there was a lot of music and there was a lot of artwork and a lot of photography. The artwork, you know, Jacob, uh, the Jacob Lawrence stuff was incredible. And the, the uh, Romeo Bearden stuff was incredible. Obviously, this, the photography was all over the place from Gordon Parks to, you know, um, can't even remember some of the other photographers in there. There's for those who are interested, you should definitely see the documentary again because there's a listing at the end of it of all of the artwork, the paintings, and photography that was in there. Um, I saw it was just excellent choices, and I think again, I think the filmmakers approached black art with from a black aesthetic standpoint, and you know, putting in the process of of where where we as a people from an artistic standpoint come from. You know, as as from dance, from music, from jazz, from blues to from, you know, photography, from painting, and really captured that. I think it wasn't just, you know, a lot of talking head interviews. It was really an approach that I think was kind of radiated that this is a place where, where we really shine and, and, and has value, you know. I also appreciated the voices of Black women um, in the documentary, helping to tell the story and providing their own insights. Because so often, even when we are dealing with, um, a black person who's the subject of a documentary, too many of the interviews are by white people adding their mm -hmm. opinions into the situation. So I, I found it refreshing to hear from black women who were validating Toni Morrison, black men as well who were um, advocating for her and, um, and really trying to shine a light on some of the discrimination, even though they weren't overtly um, talking about discrimination, it was very clear when they were pushing for her to be recognized that that's what they were pushing up against. A lily white institution that uh, only values certain voices. Okay. Yeah, a couple of weeks ago, we had, um, Jane, I did a documentary, I'm Not Your Negro, by James Baldwin, and he brought up the fact that, that um, you know, white people bear the burden of dealing with the racial problem. I mean, racism is their problem. And she says, it's like, who are you without racism? Who are you without racism, white people? You know, and I think that, you know, what's, what society, why, what's, what's, a, what approach, um, what wide approach would you take to exercise white racism? Does that make sense That's to you? That's above my pay grade. Wait, <laughs> no, I don't, I don't know. I have been certified to answer that. <laughs> I mean, it, I mean, I'm gonna put it on the key, but you're the lawyer. <laughs> yeah, you're the civil rights. That's a million million dollar dollar question. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I I don't have the answer. Um, <laughs> but one, I don't know if anyone does, but I think uh, one of the ways that we at least approach it here in Minneapolis when we're talking to white people is to remind them when we're looking at, let's say, the recent killing of George Floyd at the hands of the Minneapolis police. That was a white mother's son who had his knee um, in the back of George Floyd's neck, right? right? So that it's not our problem. Um, it, it becomes our problem when these uh, harms and this violence is being inflicted upon us. But white people actually have to begin to examine themselves yes. and what is happening within white culture that makes this kind of behavior okay. The, the brutality, the aggression, the oppression, uh, the marginalization of black people and other people of color, the denial of opportunities, right? Sometimes it's physical violence, other times it's emotional, psychological and financial violence that is being inflicted upon us and our children at the hands of white people. So there's a level of toxicity there that needs to be addressed, it needs to be rooted out. And instead of continuing to look at black families from a deficit-based perspective, white families have to take that mirror and shine it upon themselves and say, what is it that we are teaching or allowing to happen that is producing these kinds of results? Mm. Yeah, it's true. Because when I went to college, I, I went to SC also, um, <laughs> um, so, which is we need to get some of our money USC. back. USC, yeah. You know, um, <laughs> but I, I, the black... Um, I took a class, Black uh, Liberation, Black Politics, and the, the teacher said, you know what, we really don't need this class, you know, what, what, what's needed is a white liberation class, 
they are the ones that are that, that don't know they don't understand and i always remember that even though you know in the class you just kind of wanted more information more sociology more history things like that but he was right about that it's like they're the ones that are captured because they don't know i mean we're here talking right now about things they don't know we know them they don't know us and i think part of the solution may be to to dealing with it is they have to know us and somebody like tony morrison gives them more knowledge i think about who we really are as a people and not just kind of the, the surface stuff i mean you know in she wrote i mean she talks about this a little bit in, in, the, in the film about the Black Book. I mean, I have had that my whole life, as long as I can remember. And, and I don't know if you guys do too, but it was a, it was a book that was kind of just heralded Black life. Yeah. You, do, you know what book we're talking about, the Black Book? Mm -hmm. Yeah, she wrote a book called The Black Book. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, the, mm -hmm. uh, the cover looks like a collage, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I have it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, it was kind of like, it, it was, it was kind of like, yeah, it was a, I guess the whole book was really, it was like, I mean, somebody mentioned this almost like jazz. It's like stuff happening all over the place. You know, the story of Beloved's in there, or the original story of Beloved's in there. There's pictures, there's music and stuff like that. And yeah, so I, for me, that was an important book. I don't know if it was important to you guys, but it was definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I loved how she um, discussed in the documentary where she drew inspiration. Um, for the Black Book, where she talked about putting her mom on the cover. She talked about, I believe, a cousin or a, a brother who had spent time in prison. And she was asking him about language um, and just being inclusive. Because now, unfortunately, with uh, slavery being morphed into mass incarceration, that is a part of the Black experience. And for her as a, an artist, um, a literary giant, to remember those who are in prison and to understand that there that there's something unique about that culture that has formed uh, and to make sure that it's included because there are people who can relate people who draw inspiration from it um, etc so I thought that was just really powerful and just it, it just opened up my imagination and when she was talking about her role as a professor and pushing her students to be imaginative and going beyond their own experience it was just reminding me to be more intentional, you know, in my writing and my advocacy about just going beyond the bounds of what I know and imagining something different. It's, it must have been amazing to be a student of hers. I can't even imagine that experience, you know. Oh my goodness. Um, you, know, no. you, know, you know, because part of this, this thing that we're going through right now, this uprising right now, I think that it's contributed to a lot of black artists, her probably in one of them, James Baldwin probably being others, you know, the influences. And, and Nakima, you, you were out there more often. I mean, I didn't go out obviously and, and Don and, and Christina don't live here. So did you hear or feel that part of this, this, this black artists were, had influenced these students or these young people that were out there primarily uh, in this process? Yeah, it's a multi-generational movement. So you have folks in my age, I'll be 44 over the weekend. <laughs> you know, you have uh, babies out there. You have young adults. You have teenagers out there. You have children out there marching, out there chanting, out there demonstrating. And art definitely plays a role in our advocacy and our activism. We will sometimes quote some of the greatest Black thinkers um, of the past and of the present. And we will use their words to help formulate our arguments, our perspectives, our advocacy. And so there's the continuation, you know, of that history, of those words, of that power, of that creativity, and what we are doing today as part of this movement for racial justice and freedom from police violence and the need for economic justice, uh, et cetera. So yes, and then we have artists who intentionally help us create. So there's a million artist movement that's very involved in our activism, uh, as some of so after Philando Castile was killed um, in uh, 2016, we went to the governor's mansion. We had a 21 day occupation outside of his mansion. And there were artists that showed up the first night with a huge banner that was hung over the gates of the governor's mansion and stayed there the whole 21 days. Uh, chalk is even used, you know, to write the names of people who've been killed. Um, we did. Uh, one exercise recently when we were protesting the head of the Minneapolis Police Federation because of all the people who've been killed on his watch and the fact that he's validated those killings in the media, calling those officers heroic. 
we took red children's paint and we had people put gloves on and we had a banner that said Bob Crow has blood on his hands and we let the people dip their hands in the paint and put their handprints all over the banner. And now that banner is a part of what we use when we're out marching and advocating. So art is very important in our movement. It goes hand in hand with the fight for racial justice. Hmm. I, I, I wanna add that um, artists, um, African-American artists, um, I'm including for sure uh, you women in this conversation, that we tend to be uh, aware of our history um, beyond what the average person is aware of. And um, I, I think it's really important for us to, uh, in addition to creating art, but, but sharing the information we have. I um, run a program at Columbia College. <laughs> I call it an after school program because it's not, uh, it's, uh, it's not a course. The administration couldn't figure out a course. I said, okay, I'm gonna call it an after school program. <laughs> uh, college students and what they are is salons mm -hmm. and I pull together African-American students I did get some pushback about well can anybody come no it's just for the black kids mm -hmm. unapologetically no um, but I use these salons to introduce uh, the black students that I'm working with to their history in the performing arts because if they're not movie stars the students I'm working with don't know who, uh, um, um, the only way they know Ruby D is as Denzel's mother. In <laughs> That's all they know about Ruby D. <laughs> Denzel's mother. Uh, uh, but they don't know about Eartha Kitt and Harry Belafonte and Poitier. Um, they have no idea of the legacy uh, that the, and the lineage. That's how I'd like to put it that they are part of a vital lineage that they have no idea. So I, I, I think it's really important for us as artists to seize those opportunities to uh, reach one, teach one. Um, I got an email, I'll just say this and I'll turn it back over to you. We did a reading um, last year. Uh, um, I approached the, the administration that uh, we wanted to do a reading of a play uh, written by and about black women for Women's History Month. There had never been any black women included in the agenda on Women's History Month other than, you know, Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth. That's it, that's all we got. <laughs> so uh, what we did a reading, the first year we did it, we did it two years in a row. The first year we did it, we did it was that, uh, that satire by Glenda Dickerson and Brina, Brina, I want to say.